Well, we welcome all of you in the name of the Lord tonight. Very thankful you're with us, as well as those on live stream. Once again, it's good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's the kind of environment where the Lord commands a blessing, you know, the blessing, commands the blessing, even life forevermore. <clears throat> This will be our 70th lesson in Genesis. Time has passed rather rapidly. And it doesn't seem possible, 70, but we're, just, we're here. Rapidly approaching, the, actually, the conclusion of this book. And we're going to be dealing with Joseph's response to the brothers' return. We left off with Jacob consenting to send Benjamin back with them. <coughs> Reuben told him that there wasn't going to, Joseph wasn't even going to talk to him. Benjamin wasn't there, so and so we'll all die of starvation if we don't. So he finally saw it, said. He took him along, so we're going to begin with that, and then we're arriving uh, in Egypt. This is Genesis 43, verse 16 through 34. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with him, he said to the ruler of the house, Bring these men home, and slay, and make ready, for these men shall dine with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men unto, into Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were, they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time are we brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for bondmen and our asses. And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house. So they're like in the courtyard. They're not in the interior yet. Said, oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass, and we came in to, came to the inn, that we opened our sacks, and behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money and full weight. And, and we brought it again in our hand. And other money have we brought down in our hands to pay, for, pay for, to buy food. That is, we're not going to use this money to buy food. We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. He said, Peace be to you, dear, fear not. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simeon out to them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their asses provender. And they made ready the present against Joseph came at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand to the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare, and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom he spake, is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant, our father, is in good health. He's yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep. And he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on bread. And they set on for him by himself and for them by themselves. That's the brothers. And for the Egyptians, which did eat with him by themselves, 
because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled at one another. And he took and sent messes or portions unto them from before him, but Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. Amen. Yeah, quite, <laughs> quite an account. Now, over the years, the Joseph's brothers didn't look for him, apparently. They just kind of blotted him out of their mind. They hadn't thought about him. They were glad to get rid of him because not because he did anything. They just envied him. They didn't like the idea of their father being attracted more to him than he was to them. Of course, that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore, for which we're grateful. <coughs> Yet in the uh, neglected resource of their memory, that incident of Joseph still lingered. Mm -hmm. Now I'd been stirred up. Yeah. We're told that no one really ever forgets anything. That's what experts in the mind tell us. It just takes the proper stimulus and come back. Something you didn't think about for decades, it come, come right back vivid that's what happened here and but the normality of life couldn't stir it up just a regular humdrum doing the humdrum routines of life but when things become very threatening and very difficult and all, all of a sudden the memory it cranks up because you can't really enter empty-headed into trouble you, even if you try to do it you your makeup won't let you do it. You think of stuff when you're in trouble that you may have forgot for years. That's the way God made it. It's part of the divine image. Actually, this was the Lord getting them ready for a face-to-face -face confrontation with Joseph. See, the God stirred this up. Because he wanted them, wanted them to see Joseph with all this in their mind, what they did. It worked to produce fear at the awareness of Joseph's presence. See, if they didn't remember all this, it would have been too casual. In front of, they might have pretended like they, like their other brothers really did, like they told them. But see, it's written in Scripture that this is what God does. This is Proverbs 16, 1. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So when the heart stirred up, Memories start coming back. That's the Lord Amen. working with the person. Now, it's important that we don't think about this from a psychological point of view. Because psych psychology is, mo is attached more firmly to emotion than it is to rationale. Psychology doesn't deal with rationality. And they think someone's not kind of out of their mind. That's, that's, their, that's how they explain things. And so they're going to try and get it back in the right mind, see. But this isn't a psychological thing that we're dealing with here. Yeah. Emotion and self-worth are things that don't move you to think like this. Your emotions don't dig around in your memory. It just deals with mm -hmm. yeah. right here. You don't get really emotional about what's past. <laughs> you get small what's present. See that this is the weakest part of your constitution is your emotion. So if you have your emotions on your shirt sleeve and every little thing you fall apart and every time there's a little teeny glimmer of hope you really charged up and things may be better. So you'll you'll have a pretty tough life. The activity of the mind is primary, not emo and that emotion is not an activity of the mind. The activity of the mind is primary, and I want to take a little bit of time on this. Some emotional may be involved in rationality, but it's a, 
it's a fruit of rationality. Rationality is never a fruit of the emotion. When Joseph charged them with being spies, they reacted rationally, even though they were afraid. They said, Nay, my lord, but to buy food are well thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We're true men. Thy servants are no spies. See, that was not an emotional response. They didn't break out crying. I want really to kind of try to establish this tonight to show how the human race has kind of slipped. When Joseph reaffirmed they were spies, they didn't say, start crying, say, oh no, what are you going to do? They said, thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and behold, our youngest is this day with our father, and one, and one is not, or one is this. See, it's a, it's a thought out response. When the brothers heard Joseph's threat, they said one to another, they're going to think this thing out. We're verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he, he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore, is this distress come upon us? Yeah. I'm comparing rationality with emotion. They're thinking this thing out. Reuben responded. He threw in some thoughts too. Spake I not unto you? Do not sin against the child and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. It's, Appealing to the, to the mind. Upon their return to Canaan, when the grain that they had purchased and one of the brothers found his money in the sack, he didn't say, oh no, what are we going to do? Their heart failed them and they were afraid saying, they were afraid saying to one another, what is this that God has done unto us? Rational. When Jacob first refused to send Benjamin back, Reuben said, Slay my two sons. If I bring him not unto thee, deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him unto thee again. He appealed to his, to his reason. When the time came to return to uh, Egypt, Joseph said to Jacob, The man did solemnly protest to us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt not send our brother with us, we'll not go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not if thou, if thou will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, If you will send your brother our brother with us, we will go down. If thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, You shall not see my face. I want you to see how this you will rarely, rarely get in an argument with anyone without this kind of exchange will take place. Huh? You'll rarely have an argument where this kind of exchange will take place. Jacob asked them why they had even made known, you know. Why did you even tell him you had a brother? They answered, the man asked us straightly of our estate, and they explained it to him. Then at that time, Judah made another plea to ration, ra rational thinking. Send him, send the boy with us. I'll take care of him. Bring him back. Now the brothers have returned to Jacob's house, jo Joseph's house in Egypt, and they were afraid because they came, they because they were brought to Joseph's house, and they said because of the money that was in the re and so forth. See, they're thinking about. And at that time, the the steward spoke to their rationale. They spoke to the steward rationally. They said, oh, sir, we came down indeed, and you know, they explained to him. So at these times, the brothers were not moved with fear that made them run away like they're fronting, confronting a wild beast. You, know, you, don't, you have an emotional response to, to that. They were not ruled by their emotion. With all the failure these men had, and all the deficiency these men had, they were not ruled by their emotion. They are ruled by their rationale. They thought the thing out. Now I said that this is going to show us how the humanity has fallen a notch or two. Because this now, this isn't how people approach problems. Not even in the church. But I hate to say it, but 
This is not how the problems are approached. They're approached emotionally and psychologically, not rationally. When it comes to speaking to souls about the Lord, the appeal must be made to their reason, not to their emotion. Now, dear, when I was uh, coming up as a child, there were, the, the appeals were to the emotion. Sad stories, illustrations, all kind of things like that. Was the, the appeals to the emotion. They thought that the emotion, if you could get the person emotional enough, they, they'd come to Christ. Okay? But that's not so. Paul reasoned right. with Felix. Yeah, Did, uh -huh. well, righteousness and... and temperance and judgment to come. And also, when you appeal to a person's emotion, your thoughts are short. They're not extended. Because most people know an emotional person, you can't handle long sentences. <laughs> it's, just the way, it's just the way it is. That's why your kids are emotional. you got to say yes, no. You, know, you, 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 can't, you can't reason with a person whose emotion is controlling them. Well, we all, everybody knows that. You just, just have to think about it, but that's the way it is. So I'm showing here that these, these men were not ideal men, but they were better than the people of the society that we live in. They could think. Yes. In wrapping that back around what you were speaking concerning remembrance, Remembrance is often accompanied by understanding. Yeah. And once an understanding dawns upon a person, like with the disciples, when they would finally understand something about Christ and it would bring back remembrance of something the prophet said, it would be brought back to them. And I was even considering a, a conversation I had with a woman who was sharing with me her attempt to kill herself. And as she was telling me the events surrounding that, I could see that the Lord had miraculously protected her. And I started telling her that. And as I was telling her that, she started remembering other things that had happened that she mm -hmm. wasn't thinking about previously. Yeah. She said, I can see that. I yeah. can see how that was happening. But the remembrance came with an understanding. That's so right. The Lord mm -hmm. has to give understanding before you can even take information and and put it in the right place. That's right. Do something. That's right. Mm -hmm. To me, it was. Uh, I hope it, this is a, like a little bypath, but to me, this is important to see. They used to say, you know, a mind's a terrible thing to waste. Well, it's <laughs> a little bit of truth to it. All right, now with our text, they when they brought him. They brought him from the outside of the house to the interior. Benjamin's home now. He's, he's returned. He evidently finished his activities, governmental activities, or whatever. And when he saw Benjamin, when he saw Benjamin with them, now you can only think of what this, this is his, the only real full blood brother he had. All the other brothers were half-brothers. This is his only real brother. Yes? His only brother that wasn't in on selling him into Egypt. That's right. Yeah. That's right. He saw Benjamin. Now, the record of Joseph's birth is found in Genesis 30, 23. He was still with Laban at the time. After that, and before Benjamin was born, he increased his herds. And Benjamin was born when Jacob and his family were on the way back to Canaan. So it's generally thought that Benjamin was 10 years old, about 10 years old, when Joseph was sold into slavery. That'd make him seven years younger than Joseph and about 32 years of age at the time of our text. These are just estimates, but they kind of give you an idea. We're not talking about little little kids, so to speak. If you see pictures of this, you'll see a little toddler, you know. Yeah. 
Benjamin's a little toddler. Like when Isaac was offered, he's a little, the artist painted him as a little toddler. He's a grown-up man, weighed his late 30s probably. Yeah. Joseph. I used to say, well, how do you know it's Benjamin? Well, he'd seen these brothers before, and this is a new face. He wasn't there, so he knew it was Benjamin by deduction. He hadn't been there before, which means Joseph was an alert man. I think I mentioned this before, that some people never know what's going on around them. It's like living, living in kind of a little bubble in there. And they have no idea what's going on. And, and the, the world is geared, the Western world is geared to grab your attention all the time with something entertaining, so you never know. I mean, the Son of God could be standing right next to them. They would, would have no idea. See? But that's how, the, how these people were. That's not how they were. He, he recognized. He surveyed this group of brothers and picked Benjamin out right away. And he said to his steward, he said, bring these, bring these men home and slay, kill an animal, Make ready, we're going to dine. Well, I'm not sure when I'll be home. Be some give or take at noon. Even with thoughtful people, they can talk like this. Erratic people, scatterbrained people, they can't talk like this. They say, Well, I'll try. You never know what's going to happen. This is how they think. But in Scripture, this isn't how people that God was working with, this is not how they thought. They thought differently. They, they, could, they could fix times and do things at certain times. And God would tell them to do things at certain times, certain place, certain way. See, it was a different kind of a mindset. But a tremendous falling away is taking place. It's hard to talk to people like this. Some people object if you tell them a particular time or a particular place, a particular way. So it's just a minute. I'm a, I got a right to do what I want to do. Weren't like this. This is a different... This is the kind of environment God can work in, is what I'm trying to say. That God doesn't work for good in an environment where the people are unalert and unperceptive and don't know what's going on. He appears to some shepherds who could recognize it right off the bat that something was happening. These, these shepherds knew. And they reacted immediately. Just some people wouldn't, wouldn't be that way. To bring them home, fix a meal, and uh, we'll eat. We'll eat at noon. Now this, uh, the, he calls him the ruler of the house. Elsewhere, he'll call him a steward. And I wanted to say a word about steward. What a steward is. It's translated ruler here. Him who was over the house. Literally, it means him who was over his house. The steward one who manages the affairs or superintends the household of another, like Eliezer was to Abraham. The word means much the same thing in the Greek language. It's a domestic manager. Now, this is important to see because we're called stewards. It's, stewards are, are managers. They're like more like a vice president. This does cast a fresh light on the, being a good steward of the manifold grace of God. You're managing some aspect of the grace of God. Amen. That is, you're making, you're you're bringing it into the, into the sphere of life, mm -hmm. and you seeing that you utilize it right for some God ordained purpose. That's what a steward does. He's doing something. He's not sitting waiting for orders. He's already got the orders. Mm -hmm. Whatever his master says, do. Yeah. Do you think this kind of mentality exists in the average church member? Do you? Do you think the average Christian is set to do whatever God tells them to do, when he tells them to do it, and where he tells them to do it? Do you think that that's the mindset that exists in Christendom? Well, if you do, you're just not informed, that's all. That's not the example that exists. 
And that's why God's not working in that environment. Because he doesn't work in that environment. Jesus said the kingdom of God was like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered to them his goods. Here it is. You take care of this. You take care of that. You take care of the other. You take care of the animals, and you take care of the fields. You take care of the house. And that was what they were to manage. Take care of it. Being a steward over these various ministers of the body is not just a servile role. You're handling. In other words, there's, God hasn't arranged for grace to fall on people like rain. I suppose he could do that, but I'm not sure that he would be disposed to do it that way. Well, how he does it, he gives his grace, he distributes his grace to different people in different ways. He has to, under each one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of God. It's called faith, another place. And then you manage that, the distribution or use of that. See, that's why non-functional church members is a big contradiction. Amen. The king has given his goods yes. to his servants. He's distributed them because it, what he's doing is too big for one or even 12 yes. to do. Amen. It just frankly is bigger than that. So he distributes it. Stewards, manager. And the steward, he does what he's told to do. Well, this steward's been told, bring them into my house. Slay an animal. Make ready and prepare dinner. Prepare the dining with my brothers at noon. The 33rd verse says that he seated the brothers in precise order according to their birth. And this we learn something of what's involved in being a steward. Whether it's Joseph's stewards or those who are members of the body of Christ. So do you wonder why as you draw close to God through Christ, and as you live with a greater consciousness of God, you will be find yourself being more particular about how you go about serving God. You'll be more particular about it. You won't be coming to the assembly and saying, oh, I forgot I was going to do something. You'll find yourself less and less. Maybe that will happen once in a while, but you'll find less and less that will happen. You'll be, you want to do it. Why? Just for the sake of law? No, you're doing it because it's somebody else's goods you're handling. You're handing God's grace. So you're more mindful about how you distribute it. Joseph himself was a steward. That's right. And so he, he knew how to pick good stewards. Now, he just didn't entrust this just to anyone. No doubt this man had done other things for Joseph, and he now he entrusts him with something that was precious to Joseph. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's quite, a, quite a thought. I won't spend a lot more, any more time on this, but it's just something good, worthy to think about. That and This also means that when you, when you do, you serve God in this way, mm -hmm. deliberately, precisely, seeking to do exactly what, he wants you to do be as effective. You will be more satisfied with what you do. Yes, amen. Amen. It'll be personally gratifying. Yes, amen. God's the one that'll give you that yeah. that attitude. Another thing, you know, Joseph didn't say, "You go ahead and go on, and you hand out the grain. I'm going to spend some time with these." That's right. He, he would. He was a faithful steward over what he was given, That's and he right. commanded amen. his men. Amen. there. All stewards are servants, but not necessarily all servants are stewards. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I think yeah. I said that right. Yeah. All stewards are serving the one who made them stewards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but servanthood may be just doing what you're told one one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. It's possible to be unprofitable servants doing only what you're told that's to do. Right. That's right. That's right. Or only what you're commanded to do. Uh -huh. So. If, a, a, a steward is someone who the master trusts and invests in, yeah, right. mm -hmm. uh, like be thou over ten cities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is why, like, remember, he was saying, 
Timothy and Titus, he sent both of them places to find out the, the spiritual pulse of the yeah, yeah. churches that they were right. sent to. That they were stewards yes. working for the master. Now all, the, all of this work is to be done, in other words, with an acute consciousness of God. And one of the roles of and the assembly of the righteous, when they that fear of God gather together, one of the roles of an assembly is to, is to sharpen up that consciousness of God, that awareness of God. And you, you can't just, just depend on this time, but this time you, it gives an extra stimulus. It's like an inner spiritual energy booster that makes your senses and sharpens them up to a keen, keen edge. <clears throat> well, when uh, the men hear this about going to Joseph's house, they were afraid. They were afraid. They say, "Well, it's be, be this money issue. Is, he hasn't forgot about this." Now, this was what I called a rational fear. It wasn't emotional fear. Now, the scriptures record several instances of people that were afraid and why they were afraid. I'm going to distinguish what a rational, what a rational fear is. When a, a sinner confronting God, like Adam, I heard thee and I was afraid. Was, it's his thinking. It wasn't the sound, foot sound of footsteps that, <laughs> that made him afraid. It's, it's that voice. He thought about it, made him afraid. Or when facing a supposed opponent, when opponent when Jacob got to thinking about facing Esau he said to God he said I was greatly afraid and distressed he it was because he, he wasn't sure what Esau was going to do it was a thought out it was what I call a rational fear or threats of religious leaders that blind man remember his parents they asked him who how'd your son come to see well they they didn't say they said we can't say because they feared the Jews. It wasn't that the Jews were scary people. When you look at them, you got scared. That wasn't it. It was what they would do. Rational fear. Or seeing a supernatural Jesus. They saw Jesus walking on the water during a storm. They were afraid. This is, whoo -whoo, this is no ordinary man. We're not dealing with a good old friend here. See, this hasn't dawned on a lot of people. They treat Jesus like he's just a bosom buddy, you know. They haven't seen him walking on the sea. He changed their tune that time. We're hearing reports of Jesus. When Pilate heard the people say of Jesus, he made himself the son of God. He says, John 19, 8, he was more afraid. Who? Who, who am I dealing with here? Hearing but not understanding Jesus. That scares some people. The men that were with Saul of Tarsus, when Jesus called them, they heard the, voice, heard the voice of Jesus, but they didn't understand it, and it says they were afraid. Someone said, someone said something, we, but we, what did he say? And it, it scared them. They're afraid. Or confronting an un, a, a converted enemy. Some, some early believers was frightened about that. When Saul of Tarsus tried to join himself to the disciples, they were all afraid of him. It was a thought out. It's the conclusions they reached about this that made them afraid. It wasn't the sight that made them afraid. It was the conclusions about that that made them afraid. Fear was not a bodily action like hunger or illness or some kind of reaction. It wasn't like that. It was thought out. There's a proper fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge, too. It says both of them in Scripture. But this involves thinking, reasoning, drawing a conclusion. See, nobody really will ever come to Christ till they think about it, reason about it, and come to a conclusion. I will arise and go to Jesus until they think about it. See, that's why preaching has to help people think mm -hmm. and a lot of preaching I heard is not conducive to thinking you probably have heard some of this yourself but it isn't conducive to thinking so it doesn't have much power at all 
Now they reasoned, they said, um, it's because of the money. Now this happened sometime earlier, we don't know exactly how long, but they, they, they thought there's something about this money, we don't know what it is, but he's angry about this. And See, if you can get people to think wrongly, they'll act wrongly. Yeah. Satan provoked Eve to think differently about that tree. He knew if I can get her to think differently about that tree, mm -hmm. I got her. Yeah, right. All right, now, see, some people, they've been raised to know that you abstain from fleshly lusts that war, war against the soul. They've been raised, been taught that, properly taught that, as they ought to have been. But, but they, they somehow make room for Satan, and Satan convinces them that isn't so bad. He, can, he changes how they view the thing, knowing as soon as that happens, they'll do it. Yeah, right. yeah. So that's what temptation is. Temptation, from one point of view, is making the unlawful appear all right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can do it. Mm -hmm. And if it all pans out that it's true that it's sin, you can always ask forgiveness. God, yeah. God understands that we all make mistakes and so forth. He may seek an occasion against us. He may. Why did they think this way? He did it saying, look at this. He invited us here. We're going to have to, we're going to have a meal at the ruler's personal house. I mean, how blessed can you be? Why did they think this way? Now, I'm going to suggest to you it's because of the hardness of the times. These were not times when the mercy of God had been accented. Yeah. Yeah. And numerous public displays of the grace of God had been made known. See, this, this is not the kind of times. God hadn't been made manifest in the flesh yet. There had been no new births born again. There had been no one had been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. Sin hadn't been put away. Satan had been destroyed, principalities and powers hadn't been plundered, and the world hadn't been reconciled to God. And in that kind of environment, this is the way people think. What is the impact of, a, of such things upon the world, what I just mentioned had been done? It's greater than any of us know. The impact of the spoiling of principalities and powers and the destruction of Satan has had a significant impact on this world so that if those things hadn't have happened, we'd have been, the world would be a lot worse than it is now. Amen. But these brothers react differently because of what they didn't have. Now, where you have people today reacting like Joseph's brothers. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a serious problem on your hands because this is the day of salvation. Amen. This is the day when God can be found. Mm -hmm. This is the day when you can seek and find. That's the kind of day we're living in. And when people reason like Joseph's brothers, a fall in a way has taken place. So that what God has done is no longer prominent in people's thinking. See, think of a falling away that way. A falling away, people don't ordinarily think a falling away is they, they do bad things. Well, that's part of it. That's the result of it. But the falling away occurred because the, this presence of God and consciousness of God is not there. And so that liberates sin to it, express itself. When I think of the people that don't, they don't know. Church people, they don't know that sin's been put away, an end of transgression, everlasting righteousness has been brought in. They don't, they don't know, they don't even know this. So should it surprise us that they would think in a flawed manner? That their thoughts would gravitate toward the earth and they tend to be pessimistic and all this? Does that surprise you if they don't know what's actually happened? That's for the preaching of the gospel, why it's so necessary, whether people accept it or not. When that sound goes out, there's an effect on the underworld. The preaching of the gospel has an effect on Satan's domain. 
whether anybody on earth believed it or not. Amen. It has an impact on who. When Jesus came, it had an impact on Satan's empire. Amen. When just when he came, just when he showed up, it was fear in Satan's empire. Don't think for one moment this couldn't happen again. Amen. That the presence of Jesus was so dominant that it was seen in God's people, there'd be fear in Satan's camp. Art thou come to torment us before the time? Yeah. This is how they'd think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm showing here, fear is a rational thing, and when there's a lot of inordinate fear, there's a lot of lack of knowledge and understanding. Well, they communed with the steward. They came near to him. As I understand, they're not really inside the house yet. They communed with him at the door of the house. So they're like in a, what we call a courtyard. You've seen some of these houses in the Middle East. They have big courtyards, and then they enter into the house. They said, now, the first time we came, we really did come to buy corn. That's why we came. And... And we stopped at the end. I'm going to tell this to the steward. They're explaining this to the stu steward. <clears throat> we discovered our money. We didn't know why it's there. Well, here it is. We brought that very money, the very coins that were in our sack. We didn't exchange them. We didn't use them. They're right here. We got them in our hand. We brought some other money to buy corn with. We're not going to buy it with that. And we, uh, we're true men. We... We don't know how these got there. We can't tell. We can't tell who put this money in our sacks. Well, how's this steward? What's he going to say? He's going to say, well, this is none of my business. I mean, this is between you and Joseph. Well, that isn't what he says. He said, peace be to you. <clears throat> Fear not. All right, this tells me right away that Joseph had taught this steward about the God of Abraham. He'd been, <laughs> if you were around Joseph, you'd learn about God. Amen. Oh, whoever you were. Didn't make any difference. If you were his steward in his house, you learned about it. It concerns me when Christians can have friends that are their friends for years and they don't know anything about Christ. Yeah. Something's wrong here. That's right. Bad wrong. Of course, some people like to teach you not to be too pushy, be pushy. That's right. Don't be outdone by Gillette razors, for goodness sake. Yeah. The world's aggressive mm -hmm. to sell their inferior products. Mm -hmm. So let's be aggressive about testifying what we know about Christ. Just tell them what you know. Yeah. But that'll be probably very significant. We can't tell. So he says, uh, don't, uh, don't fear. This is an Egyptian, an Egyptian, an Egyptian says this to him. No, phone, don't be afraid. Peace, 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 don't be, don't be afraid. There's no reason to fear. I'm sure just that saying didn't lay their fear, just saying that. But just to think that an yeah, Egyptian, or maybe I've had, I have had this experience. Some old carnal person I worked with admonished me. That kind of woke me up. Yeah. One time I was, I don't even know what I was cast down about, but I was cast down about something. And evidently people could tell I was cast down. So I, this guy shouted out from the sheet metal shop, Hey! said, I thought Christians were supposed to be happy. Hey. I thought, oh, that's kind of a bad testimony I've been given here. Maybe you've had experience like this. Someone didn't know the Lord, it kind of woke you up. Even they knew you shouldn't fear Fear not. Now, Joseph had been several years since Joseph had been removed from Canaan. But he hadn't forgot. He's, now, he's a grown man, but he, he hasn't forgot what he learned back there in Canaan. Now, we're go I'm going to estimate that he was 39 years old. I'm going to tell you how I estimate it. During this very trip... Joseph said to his brothers during this trip, Genesis 45, verse 6, These two years hath the famine been in the land. There are yet five years in which there shall be neither be earing nor harvest. They've been 
two years the famine, right? Seven years of plenty before it, and he was 30 years when it got started. So that'd make him 39, right? 39 years old. So he'd been in Egypt longer than he was in Canaan. He'd been in Egypt five years longer than he was in Canaan. But he hadn't forgot. Uh, today there are youngsters that leave home and they forget God in less than one or two years. Some of us may have, maybe have experienced that. Children left, got out from under your wing, lo and behold, a couple of years, they forgot. In 22 years, without Jesus, without redemption, without reconciliation, without the new birth, without the gift of the Holy Spirit, in 22 years, Joseph didn't forget. Amen. Without a Bible. That's right. Quite a testimony, isn't it? Amen. That's the potency of truth. The truth, if you know the truth, it'll make you free, see? Amen. It's not that we can guarantee this kind of experience. Understand, none of us would make an attempt to do so. But one of the great handicaps of our generation is that a kind of religion has been introduced that does not require a total commitment of the people. That's being pawned off as Christianity. People just play crosses and Christ and everything on their church buildings that are empty six-sevenths of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's a community event or maybe a ball game or something like that there. Yeah. If the religion that's a foot in the land, it's dominant, it has the precedence, anything that's not like this is as the exception, it is, does not require the complete commitment of the people. They do not have to be good stewards. That's how they think because otherwise they'd be afraid not to be. Commitment, you That's right. So you, see, you see the difference? You see, and Joseph, he's like a rebuke for this kind of thing. Now, what does he say to him? Listen to what he says. He says, you're the God, Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. That's where that money come from. Your God put those in it, put it in the sacks. Well, we know that Joseph had it put in there, but now we're we're up above that now. Yeah, that's right. Other versions said he replied, "The God of your father must have put treasure in your sack for you. Your God, even the God of your father, put wealth in your bags for you. The God you and your father worship must have put money there." This is how Joseph taught this man. This is the kind of God he was serving. This is not the kind of God many Christians serve. They would never say something like that. They would never say something like that. If someone opened up their purse and, whoa, I found $100 here, no average church member would say, God put that there. That's right. You say, well, I don't know yet. No, my point is, God can do things like this. And this Egyptian steward had been taught about him. Your God, the, the God of your father, must have put the money in your sack as a gift. <laughs> and your God, the God of your father, has placed hidden treasure within your sacks for you. Now, it's one thing to know that. It's another thing to have to have an Egyptian tell it to you. That's something else. But he did. When it comes to the knowledge of God, a modicum or a small amount of real knowledge of God, like this steward had, is of greater significance than a warehouse of incorrect knowledge. No more than Joseph knew about God, and this was very small compared to what anyone here knows. And he testified of that to this steward, and this is the kind of way this steward thought. Then he adds, I had your money. That means the first time. See, the money we know, but the record go back to the steward may not even have known Joseph said put it in the sack. Because uh -huh. yeah. that was done when they were loading the sacks up. They put the money in, and the steward had taken the money. And what do you say? I, I got the money for your corn. Yeah. 
I had it. See, it's in my, it probably wasn't in his treasury, but he, mm -hmm. I got your money. So it says, God must have done this. This must be some extra gift God gave you. So by acting in this manner, putting the money in the sack, so forth, Joseph was testing his brother's integrity. Yeah. He didn't know for sure about their condition, see. Mm -hmm. Some versions put a little, a little different spin on the steward's reply. Here's the Septuagint version said, I am satisfied with the money you've given me, both as to the quality and quantity. Another version says, I have enough of your good money. I'm satisfied with the money you've given me. So, in other words, it, these verses mean that the money you just got to give me, I'm satisfied with that. But see, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> that's what it means. But that's what some people <laughs> thought it meant. Then after this, he brought Simeon out to him. So Simeon had been held in Joseph's house. Now, I don't know if there was a, a little prison in there or what, but it's just interesting. To, or maybe he had him brought to his house to get ready to give to him. But as soon as he was satisfied, he brought Simeon out to them. That's what Joseph said he'd do. Kept his word. Jesus said one of the marks of a faithful servant was that he'd take care of the master's goods. He told his parable, he said, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. See, this is how this servant's found doing. Of a truth I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all that he hath. But of that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come on a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Parable of talents say the same thing. This faithful steward. That's one of the marks. One of the marks of a faithful steward is whenever you find him, he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's busy at the master's work. See, the faithfulness of a steward is demonstrated in the absence of the master. Yeah. That's when you find out whether they're faithful or not. <laughs> then he brought the man brought the man into Joseph's house and he gave him water to refresh himself and wash their feet and gave food for their animals. Took good care of them. That's a servant for you. In the name of the, in the name of Joseph, he's doing this in the name of Joseph, see. When Abraham's servant was sent to find a wife for Isaac, one of the signs he asked for was that the, that the woman that God had chosen to be Isaac's wife would take care of his camels. Yeah, well, that's, that's what he did. He took care, took care of their animals. I imagine it wasn't like one or two animals. It would be like a caravan. Then remember that present they, they brought? Jacob gave them a present to give to Joseph. They made ready to present the present. To Joseph, who came at noon, laid it out. There's a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. They had prepared it so you could see it. I don't know if they spread it out on the table or took it out of the containers it was in, but some way they got it ready for Joseph to see. They prepared the gift for him to see. What they, what they had going to give to Joseph, they, they got it ready. You can see where I'm going here, can't you? What you're going to present to Jesus when he comes, you're getting it ready now for presentation. Right? You're getting it ready for presentation. Presenting things to God. We're going to make a present to God. Prepare it first. Don't be giving any ad hoc. Live like a nutcase all week and then come into a praise service and sing and dance and praise just like you really love God. Don't be doing that. Yeah, right. Don't be doing that. Mm -hmm. You prepare yourself when you come before yeah. God. Amen. When Moses told Israel they were going to meet God, he said, you got to get prepared. Wash your clothes. Get a change of raiment. Wash your clothes. And no personal activity between the husbands and wives tonight. They had to get ready. That's right. 
That's what they did with their prison. They got it ready. They didn't say it's out there in one of the bags hanging on the can, hanging on a on an ass out there. You go out, and you it's a third bag. You dig in there and you'll find it. They they got it ready. One servant told Jesus, "There, I, I buried it. There it is. You you dig it up." They made their present, brought it to Joseph. Upon his return home, and they bowed. Uh, this is several times now we've had. We, the first time they were there, they bowed, and they've already bowed a couple of times. They're bowing again, fulfilling those dreams of Joseph. See, when someone is knowledgeably in the presence of Christ, they like bow. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're not presumptuous. Mm-hmm. I can tell the way some people act or react in a gathering that's in Jesus' name. I can tell whether they are aware that Christ is here or not. Mm-hmm. I don't have to ask them. Mm-hmm. I know. I can tell. See, are you omniscient? No, I'm not stupid either. I can tell. People in the presence of God are very alert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Peter, James, and John were sleepy Mm -hmm. on the Mount of Transfiguration until God spoke. Mm -hmm. And they woke up. Let's build three tabernacles. You know, they were were (laughs) very alert. So, Joseph, how are you going to react to that? He didn't say, these are very wonderful gifts. Because they actually were just returning what, for our case, we're just returning what God gave us. But he says to them about their welfare. How is your welfare? Welfare in America means that you get a free meal, a free, free ticket from the government. But that's not what welfare means here. Welfare is like a summary word. How's things going with you? What would you say is the overview of your situation? Give me a Jenny, give me one sentence. How is it with the family? Welfare. How would you sum up your life? If someone asked you to sum up your life, how would you? Later, Jacob will sum up his life. My days have been few and full of trouble. That's my testimony. That's what he told Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. My life has been few and full of trouble. Mm-hmm. A little later, he had a little better, mm-hmm. improved his testimony. Now, here's a, here's a summary statement. Paul gave a summary statement. He said, I know that this shall turn out to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing else should be ashamed. But that with all boldness is always so, now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. That was a, that was a statement of his welfare. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some other scriptural statements, these are summations of welfare. Well, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's mm-hmm. a good summary. I press toward the mark for the prize, a good summary. Mm-hmm. We have here no continuing city, but we seek one to come. That's a... We're testifying of our welfare, see. Mm -hmm. I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. Mm -hmm. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. You can think think of others. They're like summations of a person's life. Mm -hmm. It's good to, sometimes you can do this when you lay down and you're by yourself. You can say, let's see, let me work on a sentence that would sum up my life. Mm -hmm. It'll take you a while, but it'll be a good exercise. You'll You'll get a lot out of it. And you'll get so you kind of like doing this. You get a search around here, you'll find this gym and that gym and the other gym. And so th- think of a summation about how is your welfare so that that may be asked at the judgment seat. They're going to say, well, how's your welfare? What, what would you say is your general state? Yes. A, leg- a legacy, if I can say it that way, can be left behind of a person who seeks God. And if they truly sought God and were rewarded for it, then this, this is what can be said of them in Hebrews eleven thirteen to 16. These died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 
For they say such things, declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. That's yes, right. That's a good legacy to leave behind when you yeah. seek God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, legacy is what you leave to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember, so this is a, this is a good statement to be said about your life. That's right. Is your father yet alive? The old man of whom you spake. Is he, is he still alive? This was not a casual question. Joseph, Joseph didn't know, see, whether Jacob had died or not. Been some time since he was home. Now, this is more of like a covenantal question. This wasn't like a family question. This was a covenantal question that had to do with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are 33 verses of Scripture that have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob together in them. And he's asking about that, that right there. Because if Jacob's not alive, that means this thing's being passed on to somebody else going to be divided up, mm -hmm. 12 tribes. He'd probably be wondering, wonder what, what part's going to be divided to me. He end up he's going to have a double portion. So Ab Joseph, knowing what God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, mm -hmm. made him intensely interested mm -hmm. in wh how things were with, with Jacob. He already knew Abraham and Isaac had passed on. He already knew, but... He was interested in knowing about this. Then at that, uh, he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin. Yeah, saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom he spake unto me? And he said, I remember he's in Egypt now. God be gracious unto thee, my son. <laughs> Notice how he referred to Benjamin. He was his own brother. His personal name was Benjamin. He was his mother's son, and he was of the youngest brother. So he's kind of very precise in the way he stated it. Been 22 years since he'd seen Benjamin. At 22 years, how it must have warmed his heart to see him the only full brother he had God be gracious unto thee he didn't say have a good day hope it goes well with you God be gracious now remember this is before Bible before the law before any extensive revelation from God God be gracious what he was saying was he's been to me hope he is to you too Later, later, he'll tell him where he is. Look, 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 look what happened to me. Look what happened to me. You think that's because I was especially gifted and smart? God God did this. God brought me here. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. See, that's the God he said, be gracious. God be gracious unto you, son. Now, the, the meaning of gracious is to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. And that's, that's what God, for God to be a show favor to you, he's, there's a sense in which he's got to like stoop down to. Mm -hmm. If he wants to save you, someone from the Godhead he has to humble himself. Mm -hmm. Come down. Amen. For us to get a blessing, this had to happen. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to come down. Yeah. He had to lower himself. Jesus had to lower himself, take a lower station. But he did so, which means God's inclined to give grace. See, grace couldn't come if this didn't happen. He couldn't, like, reach out and pull men up. Well, he had to stoop down and deal with what kept men in a low estate, and then he could bring them up. Now, God never does anything he doesn't want to do. You all understand that, I'm sure. He's motivated by his own will. 
God be gracious unto you, it's my son. doesn't mean God's going to be gracious because I said it. He said I, he wanted this, but he do. God is the one that had to show the grace. See, God works all things according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. God is always motivated by himself. He said of our salvation, according to his own purpose, the purpose of him who worketh, who worketh all things, after the counsel of his own will. So God doesn't counsel with anybody else when he's going to do something. He counsels with his own will. Now while Jacob had a deep affection for Benjamin, he is now speaking, God be gracious unto you, he's speaking in the framework of the covenant God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in Jewish history, God was gracious to Benjamin's tribe. After the Babylonian captivity, the tribe of Benjamin rose up with Judah to build the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Ezra 1 5 tells you about that. Paul the Apostle of the Gentiles, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was joined to the tribe of Judah, constituting the kingdom of Judah. Around 980 BC, the kingdom was taken from Saul. Benjamin joined Judah to form the kingdom of Judah. See, there's a tribe of Judah and there's a kingdom of Judah. And in the kingdom of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah formed the kingdom mm -hmm. of Judah. So that was grace shown, see, yeah. Amen. to Benjamin. His words were like a prophecy mm -hmm. of what was to come. At this point, Joseph is overcome. He wants to find a place to weep. And he finally he went to his own private quarters because he was yearning for his brothers. He hadn't told them who he was yet, but he sorely wanted to tell them. That's, that's like Jesus. Jesus sorely wants to tell people who he is and what he's done. But some people, they're, they're not ready yet. Yes, that's a heartbreak to you, too. If you, if you experience this, this will, be, this will break your heart, too. Yeah. Yearned after his brother. Now, Joseph had had a lot of hard experiences. We rehearsed them here. Brothers envied him. Brothers hated him. Brothers put him in a pit. Brothers took his coat from him, sold him to the Ishmaelites. But his experience did not make him bitter. And it did not make him insensitive. Amen. See, you want to see this? This is before Jesus now. This is before the Bible. This is before grace, before the new covenant, before the remission of sins. Here's a man that life was pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Still through that when you're 17 years old? See, we got some young people in that vicinity. What if that happened to them? See? Some people would get hard and bitter. Mm -hmm. Joseph didn't. He could still cry. Yeah. Hmm? Amen. I've heard people testify, our little hard-nosed businessmen. I've heard them say they never haven't cried since they were young. They tell you. They were so hard, they never, never cried. I can remember a time in my own life. I was in my early 20s. And I used to weep a lot. In my preaching, I used to weep a lot. And I noticed I hadn't been weeping as much. And it bothered me. That, what, what, am I becoming too calloused or what? In my case, the church can make you calloused. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you get so sour because of the dead religion, you get to where you can't weep. You don't want to get that. You don't want to get to that state. Amen. Jesus wept mm -hmm. about the state of people. I would like to say a word, too, about the capability to yearn. It's a strong inward compulsion, like a hungry and thirsty for righteousness. It's a strong inward. Some people have never felt this, a strong inward compulsion to draw near to God, and it's so strong they don't think anything at all about dropping off everything that inhibits it. Some people have never had that. Mm -hmm. 
Church people, I'm talking about church people. They've never had this strong yearning, strong longing, looking for the coming of the Lord. They're never, they've never entered into that yet. They know that Jesus is coming. They know they should be ready. And they got the theology right, but they just aren't yearning for it. We know they aren't because they're not purifying themselves. See, and everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. That's what this yearning, Amen. this yearning does. Remember Solomon one time, a couple of women came to him. They each had a child. Mm -hmm. One of the children died. Mm -hmm. And they both wanted to claim the living one as their own. They brought this case to Solomon. <coughs> And uh, he said, well, uh, cut the child in two. Someone come forward and cut the child in two. When the person stepped forward to do it, the real mother says her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, oh, my Lord, give her the living to give, give her the living child. Mm -hmm. Solomon said, that's the mother. Mm -hmm. That's the one. Yeah. See, when Jesus comes, there's going to be some people yearning. This is going to be the answer mm -hmm. to everything they long for Amen. when Jesus comes again. It's going to scare some people out of their wits. Yeah. It's going to cry for rocks and mountains to fall on them. But if you develop the yearning here, yes. it'll be answered then. Amen. Yearn to yearn for him. He saw a place to weep, found his own chamber, went in there and he wept. So here we have a great uh, a ruler with great power and authority, and yet he has a tender and sensitive heart. Yeah, yeah. You won't often see this, say, among politicians. They're generally hard. They're in a battle arena so much they get hard, calloused. I've been in a lot of uh, ministers and Christian leaders' meetings, but I haven't been in many where there was a lot of, where there was much weeping. It wasn't this kind of sensitivity. But there can be. Well, he went in and wept, and then he, when he finished, see, what I want you to see, brethren, is a, is a lifeless religion dries your eyes. Yeah. Dries your eyes. And you, you seem that you can justify any situation that exists. Well, God didn't turn him. Well, that's true. But how does this affect you? Are, you? are you glad God didn't turn him? Or do you weep like Jesus did? Then he, he washed his face and went out and refrained himself. He refrained himself. He controlled himself. He's like, stopped weeping. He had what self 